Good morning. Whether in person or online, it's my pleasure to welcome you to worship today. We're so glad that you're here, and I pray that during the course of the service, you might have a sense of being confirmed that you were called to be here today. So welcome to worship. Um, while not the focus of our service today, we acknowledge that today is Veterans Day weekend. So I would you know, ask that if you have served in uniform, if you would stand and allow us to, to honor you. Okay. Thank you so much. I would draw your attention to birthdays and anniversaries that are listed in the bulletin, um, highlighting as well that after the service today, they're having a cake uh, in honor of somebody's 90th birthday, uh, Russell Blackmer, so that they'll be honored uh, particularly after worship today. Um, just want you to be aware, if you're not already, of the sad news of Alice uh, Shanklin passing away uh, just a couple of days ago. Um, there'll be a, a service probably at the beginning of next year. Uh, and a reminder of Bill Buckler's memorial service on the 18th uh, at 2 p.m. Uh, also, uh, you will be reminded that there's a meeting for a Bay Village Corporation uh, immediately following the service today. Uh, so if you're hoping you can stay for that, that you won't be making a dash for the door, but stay and participate in that. Um, and as a reminder, as we started last week, there will be a discussion group in the classroom upstairs uh, following the meeting uh, to give people a chance to dialogue, um, ask questions, debate, um, whatever might have arisen during the course of the sermon. So it's a wonderful time for some give and take and some feedback. Um, do you have an announcement, Sally? Good morning. The Worship and Music Committee uh, extends a personal invitation to you all to uh, come after church November 26th to help decorate the sanctuary, uh, getting it ready for Advent and for Christmas. For those of you who are able, we have lots of work for you to do, and for the littles and those who are not quite so able, we will be having a craft that you can also work at. Uh, and there will be a light lunch served for you. If you would please sign up in the narthex, we would love to, have, to see you all there. Make the church beautiful. Thank you. Let's still our hearts during this prelude. <laughs>
Please join in our responsive call to worship. We gather to celebrate our creating God, the God who makes no junk, who makes no mistakes, who surprises us always, who loves all creation. Help us love the diversity of your creation. Help us accept all expressions of your creation. Help us celebrate those who are different from us, that we may learn to love each other as you love us. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, both human and divine. Let us pray. God, when you called each of us into being, you delighted in your works. You gifted us with differences that illuminate the breadth of beauty, wisdom, and practices of love in your creation. As we worship you this hour, free us in whatever ways we still struggle to accept and celebrate our own unique offerings. Free us from narrow thinking that confines, constrains, or condemns your good work in us. Amen. Please join together in our opening hymn, hymn number 401, here in this place. How prone we are to put up a front of being strong, successful, and unafraid. Yet we know better when we look within. Let us bring our brokenness, our lives, our hearts to God, so we might be filled with grace and hope. Please join me in the prayer for wholeness. God of creation, you fill the world with staggering diversity and variety. You love and care for all that you have made unconditionally. We are stingy with love. 
We do not always embrace those who are different or share our bounty with those who anger or frighten us. Free us from prejudice, judgment, and fear. Open us to receive your love and blessings. Help us welcome all to your table of life. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Hear the good news. Nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. Believe the good news. We are forgiven. for children, if you'd like to come forward. And I would like to thank Rusty for participating in service today. He thought he was coming down just to celebrate his uh, father's birthday, and we reeled him in. So uh, Rusty grew up in the church, and so we're glad that he can share his gifts today. Well, hi. Good to see you guys. Good to see you. you got yourself a name tag now. You look so official. What, what, and could you tell me your name? What's your friend's name? What's your name? Billy. Billy? Beanie. Beanie. Okay. I am so glad to meet you. Um, sometimes we, we walk in the door and we don't see what's right in front of our face all the time. When you come in the sanctuary this morning, we walk by a big sign on the wall on either side, either door, that says, we choose welcome. Do you remember that sign? No, I bet you don't. Can't, don't look here. It's outdoors. Just before you come into the sanctuary, it says, we choose welcome. Um, so we need a reminder. What, what does that mean? What do you think choosing welcome means? If, you're, if your mother comes home, do you welcome her? Yeah. Well, that's an easy one. It's really easy to welcome our, our friends and family, but sometimes it's, it's harder to welcome people that are different than us. Uh, when you go to school, do you ever meet somebody who's different than you? Like what? What kind of different do you see? Uh, oh, she wants me to read her mind. Okay. <laughs> I am reading your mind. You know, sometimes we have people in school that maybe have trouble walking. Maybe they're in a wheelchair. And so that's an example. Well, we need to choose welcome. It comes easy with a family, but we need to choose welcome. Or if somebody has a different skin color, we need to choose welcome. We need to be very, very intentional about that. So the sign's been there every week since I've been there. But we, we need reminders sometimes to read the sign, remember what we're about, uh, because that's a, a calling not only for this church, but for, for all of our lives. So would you welcome Beanie? Go ahead, welcome Beanie. Welcome, we're glad you're here. We're glad you're here. Let's, let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for being here with us, for friends that are new and friends that are old. Uh, we thank you that you call us to choose welcome to everyone we meet, uh, whether they look like us or not. Uh, bless our young people as they learn this lesson and learn the power of your love and grace to fulfill this lesson. Uh, bless us and bless these children to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you.
Thank you, choir. That was beautiful. And I just want to thank uh, Linda Bento Ray for um, enhancing our worship with the flute. It's a beautiful addition. Join with me now in our prayer of intercession. Lord God, our Maker, the work of your hands displays your goodness and glory. It is marvelous to behold. From the most intricate snowflakes to the grandest of mountain peaks, with each inbreaking of the sun's rays that paint the sky until day's end, your limitless love creates it all. As we gaze then upon your children, the special co-creators you have made to experience you and your beauty, may we always appreciate the dignity of each person. May we witness your extravagant artistry of each beloved, celebrate your divine imprint upon each heart, and recognize how you fashion each human being with purpose and wonder. Your limitless love creates us all. Forgive us, Lord, for the constraint of our eyes that fails to take in another's beauty for choosing the comfort of our own apathy instead of bearing one another's burdens, for not remaining silent to listen and silent when we should have cried out, your limitless love forgives us all. We pray, O God, for the wounds the world inflicts in thought, word, and deed against what your hands have made and ultimately against you. Soothe and comfort, renew and redeem. Your limitless love restores us all. We pray for unity, for tenderness, for belonging and justice and freedom, for solidarity and bountiful compassion that the world may know who you are by the way we love one another and how willing we are to enter the splendor of co-creating with one another and with you. Your limitless love heals us all. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Freely we have received, freely now shall we give with gratitude and joy. Let us worship God through our morning offering.
let us pray. Gracious God, receive our gifts, tokens of thanks for your extravagant blessings, signs of trust in your coming reign of justice, peace, and love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Acknowledging Jesus as the light of the world, let me share a poem with you entitled Light. You don't need to fetch it or make it. It is in you. The chaos out there roars so dark, but sit still and listen. Let there be light speaks in your darkness. Let it be. Let it become you, fill you, ageless it claims you, calm, unworried by what it falls on, it radiates peace. Let it shine in you, a simple lamp by the window before you bear it out into the world that needs it so badly. Come, let us join together in our hymn of preparation, come live in the light. for something a little different. Our scripture reading is from the book of Genesis, chapter 19, verses 1 through 9. Two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rode to meet them and bowed himself with his face to the earth and said, My lords, turn aside, I pray you, to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise up early and go on your way. They said, No, we will spend the night in the street. But he urged them strongly. So they turned aside to him and entered his house, and he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. 
But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, and all the people to the last man, surrounded the house, and they called to Lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us, that we may know them. Lot went out of the door to the men, shut the door after him, and said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Behold, I have two daughters who have not known man. Let me bring them out to you, and do to them as you please. Only do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. But they said, Stand back. And they said, This fellow came to sojourn, and he would play the judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. Then they pressed hard against the man Lot, and drew near to break the door. This is the word of God. Let's pray. Lord, guide us as we grapple with your word that is sometimes difficult to understand, that stretches our imagination. Guide us, fill us, enlighten us as we learn to see your word with fresh eyes. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, th this is week two of a series where we are, are tackling issues uh, that many churches sort of dance around, tiptoe around. Last week, we took an honest look at how to approach the Bible and how we need to be conscious of the lenses that we use when viewing and interpreting these ancient texts. That, that was actually, I think, a wonderful foundation for this week where we will be examining claims certain people have made regarding the Bible's stance on homosexuality. If you've heard me preach for a while, you might have half an inclination of where I might land the plane today. It was last June when I preached a sermon relating my very close relationship with a, a friend who had trouble accepting his own sexuality. My text was the story of the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts, and I made no claims that the eunuch was gay, but I did highlight how this was a dramatic story of the church growing beyond their exclusionary roots which would have marginalized this sexual minority. So while that was a powerful story, today we are tasked with exploring what the Bible actually does say about homosexuality. So as not to leave you in suspense, I'll be making the case that the Bible has very little to say about homosexuality, possibly nothing at all. So does that leave you scratching your heads? Does that sound contrary to what you have heard before? To be clear, my orientation, I believe that with our growing understanding of sexuality over the last century, we have come to understand homosexuality as an expression of sexuality that has always been there but we never had the framework or vocabulary clearly to describe before. It seems as though a certain percentage of the population has always experienced same-sex attraction, and this is not a, a gay lifestyle that is chosen, but people with an innate and enduring orientation to form same-sex relationships with the same degree of success as heterosexual couples. I'm just hoping we could say that with a matter-of-fact acknowledgement. But the point I need to emphasize, though, is that I do not believe that the views I just expressed are at odds with the Bible. I feel that many people have imposed the contemporary term homosexuality on top of behaviors 
that the Bible has viewed as aberrant or unhealthy. Last week, we talked about how there is a subset of Christians who love to use the Bible as a weapon to attack others, as a tool to impose their own notion of morality on others. But rather than focusing on the literally hundreds of times the Bible talks about responsibility for the poor, for example, this group highlights a mere six passages in the Bible that they claim insists that homosexuality is a sin. Hundreds of verses on the poor. Six passage here. These have been affectionately referred to as the clobber verses, verses where you can hit people over the head to convince them of the disastrous path of homosexuality. So I would like to focus today more on those clobber verses. In doing so, I'm hoping it will become clear that the Bible was not envisioning what we know what we now know as typical homosexual relationships. I believe this is important because for a long time a significant percentage of our population has been living under some very unchrist-like judgment. The somewhat bizarre Old Testament passage we read this morning, one of the clobber verses, sets the stage for the judgment of Sodom. Isaiah later castigated Judah as a sinful nation, comparing it to the rulers of Sodom and the people of Gomorrah. But the sins of I that Isaiah highlighted were not of a sexual nature. They were sins of opposing marginalized groups, murder, and theft. Likewise, Jeremiah, Amos, and Zephaniah invoke Sodom as well to describe God's judgment on those who oppress the poor. It is possible that the men of Sodom demanded that Lot bring out his guests so that the men could have sex with them, but this was not an expression of sexual or relational desire. It was essentially a threatened gang rape. Aggression and dominance were the motives in these situations, not sexual attraction. And as outrageous as it sounds to us, Lot then offered his daughters as a substitute for his male guests. Can we agree that the horrifying demands of this passage have little in common with those whom we know that are in long-term same-sex relationships. We find another clobber verse in Leviticus 18. You shall not lie with a man as with a woman. It is an abomination. Since we recently celebrated Reformation Sunday, you might be interested to know how this reads in Martin Luther's 1534 German translation. There it reads, man shall not lie with young boys, as he does with a woman, for it is an abomination. The word boy molesters carried through the next several centuries of German Bible translations. Similarly, in Norwegian and Swedish translations, it's referred to as boy abusers. So for most of history, most European Bibles taught that the tradition that these verses were dealing with was pederasty, not homosexuality. And by the way, the word abomination refers to something that makes a person ritually unclean. Ritual purity was considered necessary to distinguish the Israelites from their pagan neighbors. By contrast, 
Jesus stresses that he was concerned with purity of the heart. Let's jump to the New Testament now. We'll have to jump over the Gospels, for Jesus is completely silent on this matter. So does anyone know when we first encounter the word homosexual in the English Bible? It's in 1 Corinthians 6. The English Standard Version reads, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. The the troubling secret is that it was not until 1946 1946, that the word homosexual first appeared in an English translation of the Bible, the the RSV translation. Some background might be helpful. Since there never was a Greek word for homosexual, there are two Greek words used in this passage that are important to be aware of. One is malokoi, and the other is arensikopoi. Don't Hold me with a pronunciation. Malakoi was a commonly used word in ancient Greek, which literally meant soft. In a moral context, it was used to describe lack of control or laziness. The word arenso kotai was used very rarely in Greek, in fact, only twice in the Bible and literally means abusers of themselves with mankind. So it was in 1946 that the RSV translation team got together and for the very first time decided to translate these words as they're used together as homosexual. So I'm shortening a longer and more intriguing story here, but sometimes after that there were some challenges to this translation that were brought to the attention of this translation committee. As you know, committee work moves very slowly, and the team eventually admitted that they made a mistake by using the word homosexual. That was corrected in 1971, the second edition of the RSV to read sexual perverts. But by that time, the the cat was already out of the bag. The damage had been done, and that error had been perpetuated in other translations. Does anyone find this disconcerting? That a translation team can admit to making a mistake I'm inclined to offer them a little grace for they were surely trying to do the best they can. Even so, it does highlight the aspect of human involvement in what we reverentially refer to as the Word of God. Scholar Marty Nisesen writes, the modern concept of homosexuality should by no means be read into Paul's text nor can we assume that Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 6-9 condemn all homosexual relations in all times and places and ways. The meanings of the word are just too vague to justify that claim. And Paul's words should not be used for generalizations that go beyond his experiences and world. By contrast, the best methods of interpretation from the Reformation on down to today call upon us to interpret scripture through the lens of Jesus Christ's life and ministry. We we could go on and on with, with 
biblical translation analysis. But during that time, parallel discussions were going on with our confessions of faith that we hold dear. One of our confessional texts for Presbyterians is the Heidelberg Catechism that was written and published in 1563 to ensure a reformed rather than Lutheran understanding of the Christian faith. Question and answer 87. Question. Can those who do not turn to God from their ungrateful, unpenitent life be saved? Answer. Certainly not. Scripture says, surely you know that the unjust will never come into possession of the kingdom of God. Make no mistake, no fornicator or idolater, none who are guilty either of adultery or of homosexual perversion, no thieves or grabbers or drunkards or slanderers or swindlers will possess the kingdom of God. So that was originally published in 1563. It wasn't until 1962 that that phrase, homosexual perversion, was inserted. In trying to understand this edition, church historian Jack Rogers wrote to one of those who were responsible for this change, and he got the following answer. Quote, when Alan Miller and I worked on this translation in 1962, the sexual revolution had already begun, and we believed it would be well to be more specific in question 86 than Uranus was in his day. And then he added, we just thought it would be a good idea. So who thought church history was boring? One almost gets the the sense that there might have been a homosexual agenda, but it wasn't the agenda typically claimed. Thankfully, it seems that the church has continued to reform in recent years and in many cases has become more Christ-like. We no longer teach that people become homosexual by being exposed to homosexuals. We no longer strive to pray away the gay, as they did at Exodus International. Exodus International was a nonprofit, interdenominational Christian organization that sought to help people overcome their homosexual desires. But after 37 years, the founder shut down the organization, acknowledging the harm that he had caused Alan Chambers, the former president of Exodus, said, for quite some time, we've been imprisoned in a worldview that's neither honoring toward our fellow human beings nor biblical. Dr. Jack Rogers, seminary professor and former moderator of our Presbyterian denomination, clarifies the question before us. If you believe, as I do, that homosexuality is not a sin and is not prohibited by the Bible, then the next question is, how do we heal the church of this injustice that has divided us? Aside from some sort of institutional apology, I believe we need to be reflective about how bold and unambiguous our welcome is. Beyond being a a tolerant people, we need to invite people to dance, learn from the marginalized, and welcome them into leadership. May we develop a reputation in Sarasota as a place of welcome. Let's give them something to talk about. As often is the case, I'm closing with an affirmation of faith. I would hope you would not read it just because I told you to read it, but I would love to hear your voice if you could echo 
what's being said in this statement, an excerpt from a resolution that was passed at our denomination's 223rd General Assembly. Join with me, if you will, celebrating the expansive embrace of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the breadth of our mission to serve a world in need, the 223rd General Assembly affirms the gifts of LGBTQ people for ministry and celebrates their service in the church and in the world. We lament the ways that the policies and actions of the PCUSA have caused gifted, faithful LGBTQ Christians to leave the Presbyterian Church so that they could find a more welcoming place to serve as they have been gifted and called by the Spirit. With an eye towards the future, the Assembly affirms God's presence and call in the lives of all God's people and commits to seeking justice, equality, and inclusion for all in church and society. Let us join in our closing hymn for everyone born.
And now may you be empowered to be a bold participant in life rather than a timid saint in waiting. May you learn to speak with quiet authority rather than to defer to worldly power. May you find hidden treasures of joy and peace in the fields where you live. Amen. The Cake will still be there, but I would invite you, if you care, to stay for the uh, meeting of the Bay Village Corporation.